Yes, you love me as small as I am. Sometimes it's hard to walk in his footsteps of my stumble. He understands. He picks me up, wipes off my eyes, and puts me on my feet again. Yes, he loves me as small as I am. I'm nobody special. I'm no ruler. King, this the world doesn't know who I am. But Jesus walks right beside me, fights my battles and guides me. Yes, He loves me as small as I am. Sometimes it's hard to walk in His footsteps when I stumble. He understands. He picks me up, wipes off my eyes, and puts me on my feet again. Yes, He loves me as small as I am. He picks me up, wipes off my eyes, and puts me on my feet again. Yes, He loves me as small as I am. I 
Hey man, that's good stuff, ain't it? Hey man, all right. My wife and Lydia come on and get a song tonight. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just messing with them. Hey man, hey man. I didn't say nothing to them about it for church. So I just said what kind of reaction could get. Hey man, hey man. Praise the Lord. Good to be saved tonight, and uh, appreciate y'all being here at church. Like I say. Uh, Y'all pray for me. I, I come in a little late, and I still I got my work clothes on, and I'm going after service. I got to go check some skunk traps. Y'all pray that uh, they'll be very gentle to me tonight. Amen. And I just promise you, if you uh, do much skunk work for a living, you'll find out that it's not good for your marriage. Amen. And uh, so, say so, amen. And so it's almost like a repellent type thing. And so anyway, uh, we got to go to work after we get done here. But I'm glad the Lord gave me something to do. Amen. Amen. Got your Bible tonight. Turn in Matthew chapter 7. Verse, we'll look at verse 7 and 8. I may read a few other verses. And then in your, uh, your little discipleship book, if you will, turn to page 19. Uh, has everybody got one of those? You need one? Oh, that's fine. I got some. Man, we got a whole mess of them right here now. Has everybody else got one? Anybody need one? Everybody got one? Y'all need one? Sandy, y'all got one? Okay. All right. All right. Hey, man, I just want everybody to be kind of looking at the same place we're looking. Uh, I, I, be, I had a guy blast me over a King James Bible uh, last night and today. And, and uh, you know, regardless of what you believe or what you think about that, I am. He said, well, it's a movement called KJVO, which means King James Only. Uh, I've been that by conviction, not by some man telling me. Uh, before anybody ever said anything about that, God convicted my heart over it through study. And uh, so that's how God worked it out in my life. And uh, I actually, I'll be honest with you, I go a little deeper than that. I, 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 I like the Cambridge text of the King James Bible, just to be honest with you. And uh, it is differences uh, in these translations and stuff. But I'm saying all that to say this, uh, he, he hit me pretty hard about it. And uh, that wasn't even what the thing was even about. And it was talking about trying the doctrines and traditions of men against what the Word of God says. And I'm saying all that to say this. That's the reason I want you, i tell you what, what little page we are here. I could take you a study book that we got right here, and I could just teach out of it. Nobody never have one. Uh, but I, I like, when I'm doing something like this, I like somebody to have it in their hand so they can kind of see what I'm looking at and help them. That's why I don't think, uh, another thing, regardless of what you believe, that's why I don't think you ought to have uh, uh, using 10 translations in the church house because I'll be honest with you, every single one of them is going to read different. Every single one of them is going to read different. And God is not the author of confusion. And so um, that's the reason uh, that I would, even if I wasn't, uh, I, I never heard the O on the end of it, brother. And uh, that's, that's the reason I am. And like I say, I go as deep as believing the Cambridge text. I, I prefer that. I like that. And uh, But anyway, uh, that, that would be a reason for me to stay with it. Now, my question is, can you prove what's wrong with, with the uh, KJV Bible to say, no, we don't need to use it, and why are you bashing it? And, uh, but on the other end of that, we can show some errors in the others. Uh, so anyway, that's why I've said, you know, we can look together. See what we got going on here. We're all looking in the same place. And uh, I, if you're saved by the uh, same God as we are, as I am, you got the same spirit abiding on the inside. And I promise you this, the scripture and spirit will not go against one another. They always confirm one another. And so uh, all, with all that being said, uh, we're going to probably just get through the introduction on prayer tonight on page 19. And uh, I, I told my wife as I was come back in a few minutes ago studying a little bit more before I got down here, I said, we probably won't get out of the induction tonight. And so it's just like going through the, uh, we studied the Word of God. We uh, spent about three Thursday nights on that. If you don't get anything out of salvation, uh, I, make sure you get that nailed down. But if as far as you go in salvation is the Word of God and prayer, you're going to accomplish great things in your Christian life. Great things in your Christian life. If you get the Word of God nailed down in your life and get your prayer life nailed down, you are going to accomplish great things for God. Amen. So Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 and 8. 
uh, says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Uh, man, this world's looking and seeking for all kinds of things. But I believe they're looking and seeking and knocking on the wrong doors. And uh, when you start knocking on doors, doors will open. I promise you this, the devil can't open doors for you. The devil can open probably, he'll probably, more. he's actually more willing to open doors for you than what the Lord is. And uh, But when you look it back to where we was preaching on little things there uh, this past Sunday, uh, the book of Revelation says when God opens a door, he'll give us a little strength to go through. Not that we got to be strong men and this, that, and other. He'll give us just enough just to get through that door. And once we get through the Lord's door, it's going to be a great door in and into. But in verse 8 there, it says, For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. It says, Or what man is there of you whom is, uh, if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? If that little giggling rascal back there asks for something to eat, I'm not going to give him the rock to gnaw on. Amen. You know why? I'm going to have to go to the dentist. I fussed at him about cracking suckers between his teeth now. And so if we know how to give our youngins something to eat and to look after them, we, we're going to give them what they need and what they ask for. And then it goes on here and says, If ye then been evil, and, and all of us have got evil tendencies. The Bible says uh, our hearts desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? Save the Lord. And so we do have evil tendencies. But he said, If thee been evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. Uh, it's natural for us to want to be good to our children. How much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give you things, uh, give good things to them that ask Him? Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do even uh, ye even so to them. For this is the law of the prophets. And so we're going to look at these verses uh, probably just a little bit tonight in the uh, as our text verses and looking out of them and studying them and we'll be there but we're going to go to several other places and I got uh, the scripture references there in your uh, in your introduction there on page 19 uh, the way I've been going through my book the, some of the uh, things that he said I've actually highlighted in yellow and then the scripture references I've highlighted in pink so that helps me to uh, know where I need to be at and so we was talking about studying your Bible for uh, several Thursday nights we all uh, can get techniques down to use I know several years ago, whenever I used to be preaching, uh, I, I would take and write, uh, like I, I would write a scripture reference down in red. And then right here in my Bible, these little things right here, I would have a red tab. So when I looked at that scripture reference in my notes, I knew that where that red tab was at, I could flip there and I could be there where I needed to be. The next scripture reference I might write down in green. I'd have a green tab so I could go right to that scripture reference. So what I'm trying to help us with tonight, we can get some little study uh, tricks and techniques now to help us along the way. And so that's what I'm doing. So I, I said we got some things we're going to look at tonight that he said, and then I've got the uh, Bible verses. I got them highlighted, and we're going to turn to those also. And uh, after you get saved by the grace of God, uh, it ought to be a natural desire inside of us to talk to the Lord. We may not know how, or think we know how to communicate with the Lord, but it's just like a little child that's born. A little child that's born knows how to communicate. Amen. They might not be communicating like you and I, but they know how to get the point across. I'm wet. They start crying. I'm hungry. They start crying. You know what they're doing? They're letting you know they got a need. It's the same way that we do with the Heavenly Father. We, we, we cry out to Him, and He meets our needs. And thank God, isn't it a blessing to have a Heavenly Father? But after you get saved by the grace of God, one of the most vital things that we can work on in our life is our prayer life. I also believe this. I believe it's one of the most neglected things in our Christian life. And we'll talk more about that here in just a little bit. If you're around us much at all, and, and uh, you, you'll uh, begin to realize probably that we teach and preach a whole lot on prayer. I'm more of a fellow that believes in a lot of private prayer. I'm not against public prayer. There's times in the Bible to where you can have public prayer. Like we open up in prayer, we pray all while. We do those type of things. But your personal prayer life is where you go see the most accomplished at. When you enter into that closet and you're not worried about what everybody else is uh, thinking and this, that, you're not trying to put on a show, but you enter in where you know it's just you and the Lord. And we'll get to some of those things a little bit later. But your prayer life as a Christian is one of the most vital things that you have. Uh, I like this. I highlighted this up in the introduction there. It says prayer is recognizing that man is not strong enough to meet his own needs. Man is not strong enough to meet his own needs. 
I, I want to tell you tonight, that's when God started dealing with my heart. Um, I, I've always, since I, I didn't have a lot of people around me growing up as far as to kind of take care and look after me uh, in a lot of senses. So I got kind of used to doing everything myself, if that makes sense to you. Uh, my wife says I can't cook and I, I, I looked after myself till she come along and she's a lot better cook than I am. So I just let her uh, keep me plump and happy. Amen. And, uh, but I, I can if I need to. And I got used to looking after myself. If something tore up, I would try to fix it. I didn't have nobody to fix it. I didn't have no money to pay anybody to fix it. And I've always been the kind of person that just goes about and tries to take care of whatever's going on in Randy's life. I try to take care of that myself. And I've always been like that. And I've got to be careful even after I got saved. I still got tendencies for that. But when the Lord got to deal with my heart as a lost man, uh, man my wife had a, uh, she had a miscarriage. I wanted to help her and I couldn't help her. And uh, man, I don't know if y'all ever been down that road or not where somebody's going through something you want to help and you just cannot help. I felt helpless. And I'm living, after 10 years of being out on my own, I moved in with my in-laws while they building a house. Man, I felt like I felt like I wasn't I wasn't where I, I you know where I once was, and and so I, I had some feelings about that, and and then the house wasn't going along like it ought to, and dealing with things, and I had no control over, and through all that, the Lord started dealing with my heart, and I tell you what got me the most is I got to the place to where I realized I couldn't handle everything in my life, and that's where God started dealing with my heart, and I realized I needed a Savior. I need to be saved by God's amazing grace. That's the same thing that our prayer life is. It's you and I recognizing that we cannot do this thing by ourselves. We cannot do this by ourselves. Most of the time we try to do it by ourselves. A problem hits, we do everything. Most of the time first, we'll go through all these little regular routines that we do before we will even consider praying about it. A lot of times we'll post it on Facebook. As soon as it hits our thoughts, as soon as something goes, we'll post it on Facebook. And, and I'm not against everything on Facebook. Don't get me wrong. I put a lot of stuff on there. Y'all check my dogs out eating peanut butter a while ago before I come to church. Amen. Funniest thing you've ever seen in your life. I'm not against those things. But a lot of times we'll run to Facebook to put it out instead of putting our face before the Lord. And so that's where we need to make sure we get at is putting it before the Lord. And so we need to recognize prayer is us recognizing that we cannot do this thing by ourselves. This thing of just living life as Randy, I can't do it by myself. Life is crazy. And y'all pray for us this week. It's been one of our craziest weeks we've had in a long time. And, and uh, we've had uh, already had uh, one funeral this week, a man dear to my heart. We had some things going on that I told y'all about during prayer time. I'm going to try to watch what I say in front of this camera so people don't go around telling lies again, calling people, and uh, getting people called on us and stuff. Amen. And so, and got another funeral tomorrow. And man, it's just a crazy week. And I can't handle this week by myself. And I know somebody on that funeral Tuesday, uh, Cliff was just like a grandpa to me. And it was a tough funeral as far as being able to get through it. If it were not for the grace of God, we wouldn't have been able to do that. And so if prayer is us recognizing that we need some help in this life. And I don't want to get to the place to where I feel plumb helpless and hopeless before I start praying. Amen. And so it also, our prayer is us realizing uh, that we don't have enough wisdom to solve our own problems. We don't have enough wisdom to solve our own problems. Now, if you don't mind, let's flip back a couple of books into the book of James, if you don't mind. And we'll read James. It's there in your introduction. Uh, we'll read James chapter 1 and verse 5. James chapter 1 verse 5. I tell you, I, I'll be honest, I've always, ever since I've been a, a teenager, I've, my friends has always been older than I have been. Um, I can't explain that. I don't know why it's always been like that, but my friends, my, most all my good friends have always been older than, than me. Uh, when I was in, uh, went into middle school, uh, I was the littlest guy in uh, middle school, just to be honest. And uh, gym class is always intimidating. Or I've always heard about gym class and seen it on TV. Gym class is where all you get, where you get picked on, get hung on hooks and all this stuff, right? So I go into gym class. It's this big redheaded guy sitting on the back row, sitting on the bleachers. Big old buff guy sitting on the back row. Here I am. I weigh about 83 pounds. He probably about 183. He looked at me and says, come here. And I said, oh, Lord, here we go. We're going to get hung on a hook first day of gym class. And I went back there, and he had failed a couple of grades. And me and him wound up being good friends in school. He was older than I was. And so, uh, and then on through life, I've always had older friends. And I thank God for the older friends. 
But what I'm trying to say, do you know what a blessing is to hang around some older people? They got more wisdom than I got. They got more wisdom I got. I always loved hanging out with my grandpa. Some people thought it wasn't cool hanging out with your, with your grandparents. But I, I, I loved hanging out with my grandpa because he could tell you stuff that a book can't tell you, that a college can't tell you, that only life can tell you. And the only way somebody can tell you about those things has already been through and got some wisdom about it. I like hanging out with another one in here that's a little bit more seasoned than I am. I ain't going to call his name, and uh, but he sure tell you a lot about mcnicking. If you don't know what mcnicking is, that's mechanic it, amen. <laughs> and uh, we've seen a lot of bruises happen over there in the shop along the way. But it can give you some wisdom. And, so, and it's good to hang out with those senior saints to get wisdom. But can I tell you the greatest place to get wisdom at? James chapter 1 verse 5, look what it says. If any of you lack wisdom, can I go ahead and tell us all we're not, not all as smart as we think we are. Amen. If any of us lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and unbrowseth not, and it shall be given him. It shall be given him. And so when we got some decisions to make in life, Bible says in a multitude of counselors there's safety. That means if you got some good Christian friends that you can talk to about a situation, it's good to get advice from it. And uh, I told you all about the situation that I had. I called seven different preachers. And every one of them, I called them at different times, every one of them told me the same thing in different words. And so when those seven different preachers told me the same thing in different words, and on different seven different phone calls, I knew that I was headed the right direction. Because, I, man, I tell you, I was a young, I was a young preacher, I was a young pastor and everything else. And But when them men of God said, hey, this is, you know, they're senior, they're older, they got wisdom, I'd already been praying about it. And God had already laid on my heart what to do. But when I called them and they confirmed what God had already worked out in my heart, that gave me the green light. Amen. And so if any of you lack wisdom uh, about making decisions or getting through life, I, I was praying with somebody yesterday. I prayed that God give them wisdom about the decision that they was going to have to make. Because I tell you, some things we just don't know what direction to go and what direction to turn. And so if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And the Bible says he will give it to all men. If we come to him and ask as a child of God, he'll give it to you liberally. And uh, that's the only liberal part I believe in, so God giving liberally to us, uh, liberally, amen, and unbridled or not, and it shall be given. So when we come to the Lord and uh, we got problems in life, he'll give us the wisdom uh, that we need, amen. I also believe this, and uh, don't, 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 don't misunderstand what I'm, what I'm about to say. Now, I, I believe God gives doctors enough sense to help look after us. Matter of fact, Luke was a physician. God ain't against doctors. But before we take off and go to a doctor, I think we might ought to ask the Lord the direction that we ought to take. Amen. And uh, we ought to go to the great physician before we're led to another physician is what I'm trying to say. And uh, don't say, uh, uh, Preacher Cook, don't believe in going to the doctor. No, you better believe if something uh, goes on my life bad enough, I'm going to run on down to the doctor. If not, my wife's going to make me. Amen. And so we'll go on anyway. And so if we lack wisdom, let's ask of the Lord. And the Bible says he'll give it to us. And then the very essence of prayer is coming, uh, coming to God and asking him for the things that we need. Uh, if you don't mind, you can flip back from James, go back to the left, the book before, into Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16, if you don't know this verse, uh, you need to go ahead and mark it down somewhere if you don't know this verse, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. Now, may I go ahead and let us know as you're turning back there that these, uh, these promises about prayers to the believer, everything about prayer and the promises about prayer is to the believer. And we're getting ready to get to that here in just a minute. It's to the believer. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16 says, Let us, he's speaking to those that are saved, He's speaking of those that are born again, that us are those that's in the family of God. It's not this other crowd that thinks they can run to the Lord and use them as a spired tire and get their fix a flat and run on again and this, that, and the other. But it says, let us, those that are saved, born again, therefore come boldly. When you look at word boldly up, it would have the sense of being confident. That's what it means. Don't mean you come to the Lord with your chest puffed out like that. It means you come to the Lord with confidence. So when you and I come to the Lord, we can come with boldness, with confidence, with assurance that God is going to help us. And it says, come boldly unto the throne of grace. Man, I'm going to tell you what, I'm glad that the throne of God is built upon grace tonight. Amen. This whole thing is about grace. 
Man, you got grace before you get saved. You got great. You hear me say this all the time. You got saving grace, strengthening grace, sufficient grace, sustaining grace, all the grace you will ever need because God's throne is a throne of grace tonight. Amen. I, I, can, I, I can imagine this is just the way my mind works, and I know this is not the way it is, but I can just see the Lord sitting up on a throne. And you know, you, you see these chairs on TV. We took those others back there, but got arms right here, and I almost see them sitting there. And this, this leg here would say grace. And this leg here would say grace. And I believe everywhere you look, I believe it had a big high back. I believe across the, the head of the back of that chair, I believe it said grace. And I believe it's all in gold. It might even be wrote in, uh, it might actually be in silver because silver in the Bible is a metal of redemption, amen. And gold been a metal of purity. He might have grace wrote in silver over here for uh, redemption. Might have grace over here wrote in gold for uh, for purity. And but when I when that's what I when I think about a throne of grace, that's what I imagine. That's what I see. And that chair is sitting up on a huge pedestal. And at the bottom of that pedestal, it just says grace. Amen. And so everything about God's about grace. He has a throne of grace. And you and I can come to this throne of grace. And listen, listen to the reason that you and I come to this throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. You and I need some mercy. We don't, man, I'm glad God's not going to give us what we deserve. You and I need mercy tonight. Amen. You ever heard that saying, throwing yourself on the mercy of the court? That means you're, you're, you're basically pleading that. You know, show, me some, show me some forgiveness. Show me, show me something. Don't hold me accountable, amen. But he said that you may obtain mercy and look at this and find grace. What else do you think you go find when you come to the throne of grace? You go find some grace. And look what you're going to find mercy and grace to do, to help in a time of need. So where are you going to go when the problems come? You and I that are saved by God's amazing grace, we can come with confidence into that throne of grace that we can find some mercy and find some grace to help us in our time of need. Every one of us in here has got different needs. Every single one I'm sitting in here. Things that I've got needs for, you probably have no idea, and uh, it probably wouldn't bother you a bit. Things that you've got needs for right now, I have no idea. And be honest, if I did, it probably might not bother me a bit. But I'm saying this, every person that's got a heart beating in their chest and lungs and breath in their body has a need that needs to be met. And we can come to that throne room of grace to find mercy and grace to help in the time of our needs tonight. Amen. And so when we look at prayer, we're telling the Lord or we're realizing ourselves that we don't have what, what we need to meet our needs, but He does. We're telling the Lord and ourselves that we don't have the wisdom to solve the problems in life. And so what we do when we come to that throne room of grace, we're coming to say, Lord, I need your help. And he shows us mercy and gives us some grace to make the next steps in this Christian life. I don't know about you, but that blesses my heart tonight. Amen. Amen. So uh, now, if we will, let's turn back to Matthew. Flip back over there to Matthew tonight. And uh, we're going to get that next little uh, introduction paragraph there and we'll be done. Amen be done for the night and uh, then I'll let some of y'all ride with me and we'll train you how to uh, get skunks out without getting sprayed tonight amen I can't promise that because it don't always work like that but y'all turn back to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9 we'll read that here in just a minute but prayer is offered up on the basis of our sonship or spiritual kinship now this is one thing I said a while ago the, the promises of prayer are to the, the children of God the promises of prayer or to the children of God. I harp on this a whole lot because we're living in a world that thinks they can talk to God anytime they get ready. That's the world that we live in, but that's not the Bible that we have. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not the God that we have. That's not the Savior that we have. And so I, I want us to look real carefully at these verses of Scripture here in this, uh, this introduction as we get into uh, teaching on prayer here on Thursday nights. I want us to get into this, but Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9 let me get over there myself, amen. And said, after this manner, therefore, pray ye our Father, our Father, our Father, which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. That, that's giving reverence to the name of the Lord. I've never called anybody my daddy besides my daddy. I've never done that. I, I don't, I, I'm just, he's my dad. And uh, I've seen times that I had to go to my dad to, to help with a few things. Amen. And so, the basis of our prayer life is based upon our what the Bible would call our sonship or, or us being born again into the family of God. When I say sonship, it's just like saying mankind. That means all humans. 
And so when I say sonship, that means all born-again believers. So our prayer life is offered and based upon being part of a spiritual kinship and being part of the sonship uh, of the God of heaven. When we go to him, we can call him our father. That's how we get, we get, his, uh, get his attention. I've got the word now. Every time I hear about a three-year-old young and holler or say something, I'm being Walmart and I hear that little voice. Man, I go to listening to see if it's mine because I know how quick he get away from you. Amen. And then when I realize he's not mine, you know what I do? I kind of calm back down because he's not mine. But, but if I hear him holler for Randy, it gets my attention. You know why? Because he's the only one who calls me Randy. And when I hear Randy, I say, man, I'm going to check out and see what's going on. It's the same way with us that are saved by God's amazing grace. Others are called out to the Lord and call out to the Lord and call out to the Lord, but that's a strange voice to the Lord. But when you're saved and born again, we recognize his voice and he recognizes ours tonight. So the promises of our prayer life is based upon us being saved by God's amazing grace. If you're not saved, you cannot call him your father tonight. You've got to be born into the family of God. Amen. And so it's based upon sonship. Based upon sonship. Now let's go back to our text verse. Flip over one more chapter. Matthew chapter 7 tonight. Prayer is based upon sonship. That's just like uh, a little youngin coming up to me and asking me for something. I'm not obligated to look after any youngs except those that are mine. I mean, I'm just being honest. I'm not obligated by law to look after any youngins but mine. I mean, that's just the way it is. I'm not trying to be ugly or nothing. That's the same way with the Lord. He's not obligated to look after any, any, anybody that's not his youngins. Amen. A lot of people don't like that. They don't like to hear that. This, this is not, when, when, God, when Christ died on the cross, it wasn't a, a whole world salvation. He, say, he would save the whole world if they would turn to him. But they're not turned to him. And so everybody's not his children tonight. But Matthew chapter 7 verse 9 says, or what man, man, man is there of you whom if he ask, uh, his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? We've done read this. Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a snake? Now that depends on if he was at the cook house. Amen. Because I didn't want my kids getting fish. I wanted them to get snakes at the house. Amen. <laughs> and so, that's just a little inside humor there. But anybody with any sense would rather uh, give their young and a fish than a snake. Amen. And so if you being evil then know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask Him? Talking about them, meaning His children. And so here again we see that it's based upon sonship. Prayer is a son asking his father uh, for personal needs. It, and so it's just like when, when my young, like, like Cam, he'll ask us, he said, I, I want a nugget. Chicken nugget, chicken nugget. That's, I, I, I guess that's all he eats, ain't it, honey? Just chicken nuggets all the time. He wants a nugget. And beanie weenies. And every now and then he'll ask for an apple and SpaghettiOs. So no, he don't just eat chicken nuggets. And then he'll say a sucker. He, they, he, it's a bag of suckers was sitting over there, and he found out he could get up in a chair and get them, so he a sucker and just sat down. But if he can't reach it, you know, he, he gets one of us. And uh, he's a lot like us, too. He'll get a little juice out, and he says, I can do this. I got this. I ain't lying. If I'm lying, I'm dying. Amen. <laughs> But he'll get something out and he'll, he'll, he'll say, I got this type thing. And he'll fool around over there for a few minutes. And then he'll wind up, a lot of times he'll bring it to you, but sometimes he's still got a little pride. You have to say, do you need me to help you with that? Isn't that the way we are? We, we say, Lord, I got this. And we go on about it and we find out that we ain't got it. And then we have to say, Lord, I really need your help right here. Amen. That's the way children are. Children are naturally rebellious. And then we get to a place to where we have to ask for help. And so our, our prayer life and the promises of our prayer life are based up, up uh, on us being children of God. And so it's just like a son or daughter asking a father for a personal need. Uh, they was talking about the bread and talking about just uh, eating here. You know, right now most of us are blessed enough to where we don't have to pray our food in. But you know, if you go back and you just study, they call it the Lord's Prayer, but I call it the Disciples' Prayer because it's a model prayer. They prayed, give this day our uh, give us a day our daily bread. They was praying for necessities of food on a daily basis. We could get back to that place. I open my cabinet at home, crackers, oatmeal, cookies, or something go fall out about every time you open that 
that pantry door. It's it's packed full of food, and we open it and we look in there and say, "Why well, ain't nothing to eat?" Are we not guilty of that? It's just not something we want to eat in there. But we we've been blessed. We got plenty to eat. But we may get back to a place where we have to pray for daily bread. And so I'm saying all that to say this. Uh, sometimes we have to ask the Lord to help us with our attitude. Amen. Lord, I ain't got Lord, you go going to have to me with attitude. And uh, I, I promise you, sometimes when he knows what kind of attitude you go going to have, he'll fix things until you get control of it. Amen. And so anyway, I thank the Lord for that. He knows how to look after us when we don't even know how to look after ourselves. So coming to the Lord, we ask the Lord to meet our uh, meet our personal needs. And maybe you had an un- something unexpected come in your life. Miss Betty, she was talking about the shower there or the bathtub the other day and how all those things took place and needs was man. Thank God for that. I'm glad the Lord knows how to look after his children tonight. Amen. And so we, we're excited about that. And those that are saved right here, he's got a little group of children over here. And you, you know what he's going to do? He's going to look after every one of us. He's going to look after every one of us. Isn't that good? Amen. Amen. And so it's based upon our sonship. It's based upon being kin to the Lord. It's based upon him being our father. It's based upon us being adopted into the family of God. And you and I that are saved by God's amazing grace, we can come to him and ask him to meet our personal needs. I like it when, uh, when when my kids let me know they need something. I really do. Now, I ain't a good spiritual father. I ain't like God the Father. Sometimes I fuss about it a little bit. Some of y'all like it, ain't you? Fuss about it a little bit. But on the inside, you really like it when they come ask you for something, don't you? Amen. At least that's the way it works for me. And then in prayer life, I, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but in prayer life, a lot of times, you don't have to just come to the Father to ask for something all the time. Listen back there, Lenny, Cam. Y'all don't have to come ask for something all the time. I tell you what's an extra blessing. I stand there in the kitchen just a little bit ago after I fed them dogs peanut butter, and my daughter just walked up to me and threw her arms around my neck and just stood there and held me for a minute. You talking about helping a daddy now? I probably could have whooped half a sand of ridge after that, amen, if I needed to. It done something for me. You say, what do you want? Whoops, I don't. It's just a figure of speech. Amen. But it done something for me that I cannot explain. So every now and then, it's good for us to just run our Heavenly Father with arms out and say, hey, I just want want to love on you for a little bit. Amen. And so it's based upon sonship. It's based upon getting our needs met. But then let's uh, let's go to one more, at least one more verse tonight. Well, we'll go to two more places in the Bible tonight. Uh, John chapter 9, verse 31. If you will, turn there. So go from Matthew... Uh, Mark, Luke, and John in your gospel. So turn to John chapter 9, verse 31. But I tell you, uh, several years ago, I, I was reading through my Bible, and I, I run across this verse right here. It changed my, my, my world on the way people pray. John chapter 9, verse 31. We'll look at it here in just a second, give you time to get there. And then we'll read it and we'll give you a few thoughts on it tonight. But it changed the way I I, I look at uh, at the way people, they pray. John chapter 9 verse 31, it says, Now we know. Now we know. So, Whoever was there, he said they knew. But I'm afraid a lot of people don't know nowadays. And so every chance I get, I try to let people know what the Lord said right here. Amen. It says, Now we know that God heareth not sinners. You know who that is? Those are the ones that's not born again. Those are the ones that's not saved. Y'all can correct me if I'm wrong in this, but I tend to lean towards your side. You know, after we get saved, we just talk about how we just old sinners saved by grace, this, that, and other. That that is true in a sense, but after you get saved, you become a son of God. Behold what man of love he bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. He loves us. We're part of a royal priesthood, part of a peculiar nation, uh, or, or, or uh, a holy nation, peculiar uh, people. That's who we are. Yes, we are sinners saved by grace. But I'm afraid sometimes we look more down on ourselves than what God ever intended for us to look down on ourselves. Now, we're not somebody because of who we are, but we're somebody because of who He is. 
uh, we're somebody because of what he's done in our life. And we shouldn't be proud of what we've done because we've done nothing, just to be honest about it. But we should be proud of what he's done for us. And so when we see this, he says, God heareth not sinners. Those are the ones that's not saved by God's amazing grace. So he don't hear them. You can go ahead and mark her down. He don't hear them. I didn't write the book. I just read the book. I just read it to you. If, if I didn't say nothing else right here, now we know that God heareth not sinners. You wouldn't need nobody, at least I wouldn't, wouldn't need nobody to explain what that means. He don't hear lost people. 99% of the time when you get on Facebook or some of the social media, and we talk about that a lot because a lot of us has got it and we see it and everything else, you'll see all kinds of people on there saying they're praying. Well, they can pray all they want to, but they're just wasting their breath if they really are praying. They're wasting their time. They're wasting their energy if they're not saved by God's amazing grace. I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings, but that's just the way it is. And, and I, I didn't write it. I just read it, and it's in there. And when I seen that several years ago, I'm like, wow, we've got all these people that say they're praying and got this prayer life, and you know good and well they don't know the Lord. They're not sons of God. They're not children of God. They're not being adopted in the family of God. He don't hear their prayers. But then look what it says. He said, but if any man, that be mankind, be a worshiper of God. That's talking about worshiping God in spirit and truth. Because some people say they're worshiping God, but even Paul said, you know not what you worship. Even the lady at the well, and she the one that went up there and said, well, we go up in the mountain to worship and do this, all this, that, and the other. She had no idea what she was doing. you got a world today that say they worship God, but they're not worshiping the God of this Bible. So you worship God in spirit and in truth. But then it goes on to say, and doeth his will. And being in the will of God makes a big difference in our, in our Christian walk, in our life, when it comes, to our, it comes to our prayer life. If you've been disobedient as a child of God, God is not obligated to answer your prayer. If that little boy, that little girl back there being mean, I don't want to bless them when they're being mean. You know what that does? That condones their actions. I don't want to bless them. I, I told my young when they when I, I help them with the they rent at school and stuff, and uh, but they start messing up. I can't I can't give a blessing out. You know I can't, I don't want to help in that area to keep on. Uh, I'll be honest with you. It was a man that was a very wealthy wealthy rich man. And when he passed away, he didn't leave his children any of his inheritance because all of them was walking disobedient and contrary to the things of God. And he said, they, they said this really made a mess there, but he said, I don't want to uh, give my youngins money as something that they go run out and blow and waste on a sinful life. And so what he wound up doing, he, they wound up fixing an organization that actually puts that money back and other churches give to that, that when somebody's going in planting a church somewhere, they can get a grant from that place. That's where that man's money went. Instead of giving it to rebellious, disobedient children that would blow it, and before he died, he, he fixed this group, this organization that would uh, help church plants to get started, to get to build buildings to get into to help a community to be planted in. You say, well, I wouldn't have done that. Well, if you ask God wisdom, he may lead you that direction. I don't know. Amen. And so anyway, I said all that to say this. He heareth not sinners. But a man that's going to worship God, he must be in the will. And then look what it says. Those last three words are sweet. Him he heareth. Isn't that a blessing tonight? I'm glad to know that I, I am a child of God tonight. And uh, when I worship the Lord and I'm in his will, I'm thankful to God that when I say, hey, Lord, I, I, I need you right here on this, I'm thankful that God's going to move right in. Amen. And see, the problem with this world, this world, they act like God owes them something. God don't owe us nothing, amen. He don't owe us a thing, but that's what the world acts like. And uh, they, they won't, most people, I, I'm, I'm just being honest, I, I've been at this thing about 17 years now, and uh, Gary's been over there at Shining Light for a, a long time too. Uh, you see a lot of people run in, get them a little prayer, it seems like get them a little fix, and you never see them again. That's the crowd that the Lord's talking about right here. Run in, get a little fix, head out. Rick. Run in, get a little fix, head out, never see them again. And that, that's not what prayer life is about. Uh, prayer life's not about that. And But you see, I, I had this one lady, I posted that years ago. Man, when I first seen that verse of Scripture, I posted that thing immediately. I said, God don't hear you if you ain't saved. Then this lady started blasting me from over at One and Co. And uh, she said, uh, well, how you going to get saved? 
So here we go with this long theological debate on, on, on Facebook there. God, it, it's a hard thing to start off with. And after you get that thing settled, confession is made unto salvation. You, it, it's, not, it's not in the prayer to start off with. Let me go ahead and say that. You will find nowhere in the Bible where you find a sinner's prayer. I ain't, I, ain't, I ain't saying I'm against it or anything like that, but you find nowhere in the Bible where it's a sinner's prayer at. And so that's even beside the point. But let, let, let's go over here into Luke chapter 8. Luke, Luke, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. So go back uh, one to the left, one book in the gospel. We're talking about the Lord not hearing sinners. If you're not saved and born again, the Lord don't hear you. Luke chapter 18, we'll look at, uh, let's see, we'll start at verse 10. And even in this, what we would look at as a prayer here in just a minute, it was a heart thing to start off with. It was a heart thing to start off with. Luke chapter 18, verse 10 says, Two men went up into the temple to pray. We're talking about prayer. Temple was a place of prayer. The one a Pharisee, that's that religious person. Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. So you see right there, he wasn't talking to nobody but himself. We got a lot of people in this world that say they're praying and they ain't talking to nobody but themselves. Prayed thus with himself. He said, God, I thank thee that I am not as this other man, extorter, unjust, adulterous, or even as this publican. He's sitting there before God praying, or said he was praying, and said, Lord, I'm a whole lot better than this other guy is. I'm telling you right now, God don't hear him kind of prayers either. And then look what he said in verse 12. He said, I fast twice in the week. He said, Lord, I do all this. I'll be honest with you, Lord, ain't it real impressive what we do? The Lord's impressed with obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice. The Lord's more impressed with what's in the heart than what, what, what we do on the outward side of things. What's in the heart will make a difference. He said, I give tithes of all that I possess. Now, I, I'm telling you, any average church would love to have somebody that's go fast twice a week and go give tithes of all they possess. But the Lord's not impressed with that. And that's not what we need to be looking for as a church and as Christian people. Amen. Now let's get down here in verse 13. And the publican standing afar off. He didn't even want to get up. He didn't even think he was worthy to get up there near where this, uh, uh, the, the, the Pharisee was at. And so he was standing afar off. Bible said he would not even lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. You know what that is? That's humbleness. That's a broken heart. As somebody that knows exactly where they stand at before the Lord. Amen. And may I go ahead and say when we come before the Lord, we need to realize where we're, we're coming into the presence of a, a, a father. We're coming into the presence of royalty. And he deserves respect when we enter in. Amen. And uh, I tell you, I, I don't believe we do that in the right way a lot of times. Th this publican wouldn't even so much lift his eyes up to heaven. Then the Bible said smote upon his breast. That's a picture of sorrowfulness, if you will, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He prayed one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven words. Seven in the Bible's number of completion. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He knew where he stood. Now, this is when God starts hearing people. When they come before the Lord, realize who they are, and they begin to ask for mercy and grace in their life or forgiveness for where they've been, that's when you get to enter uh, the ear of God. And that's when He sees you and takes you from that, that, that repentant heart and that heart that's turning to the Lord. That's when He takes you and begins to place you into the family of God. He adopts you into the family of God. Amen. And so He hears that. And then in verse 14, this is what Christ told His disciples. He said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Amen. Amen. So when we come to the Lord, uh, you say, well, the Lord don't hear sinners. He don't until they want to turn to him and uh, be saved and born again and forgive us for the sin and not just get through the problem they got going on. Amen. I read this last scripture tonight, uh, Psalm 62 and verse 8, and uh, we'll be done. Psalm 62 and verse, verse 8 tonight. 
It says, Trust in Him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. See law. And that word see law means just stop and think about this for a minute. So you and I that are saved and trust in the Lord, we can come before Him at all times. Not just sometimes, but at all times. And we can pour our heart out before Him and realize that God is our refuge. Amen. I don't know why I was thinking about it. I was going across the yard the other day. I was working on some stuff there yesterday and I was going back and forth, and man, I got this thing about what all the Lord is. And I got to, I just got to saying that stuff out loud to myself. Amen. I said, He's our refuge. He's our comfort. He's our hope. He's our guidance. He's our shield. He's our buckler. Man, I tell you what, the Lord is everything you and I need. Amen. And so when we come to Him in prayer, no matter what our need is, we got a Father in heaven that can meet that need. Amen. And uh, I'll be honest, I ain't got to go to no Father. I ain't talking about my, my, my birth dad. I ain't got to go to no church father and ask for nothing. Amen. Bible, matter of fact, he said call no man father. I ain't talking about your dad, but the Bible tells you not to call no man father. I'm trying to quit tonight. <laughs> but that's why I don't understand how some of these people get involved in stuff when Scripture plainly speaks against the stuff that they do. Like, talking about the Catholic stuff now. That got me thinking about it. You know, the Pope's not supposed to have been married. Catholic Church believes Peter was the first pope. But Peter had a mother-in-law that Jesus had to go heal. Well, if a pope wasn't supposed to have a wife, the first one shouldn't have had a wife if they say that's who the pope was. And then the Bible says not to call no man father, but that's what they want to call the, the, the priest or whatever that's at that church and stuff. And so I'm not picking on that particular thing because... Uh, you know, but that's just one that hit my mind. But you and I, we got a father in heaven that needs to be called father. He deserves to be called father because he's the one that looks after you and I. He's the one that forgive our sins. He's the one that gives every good gift and every perfect gift come down from the father of lights with whom there is no variableness. Amen. And so that's who we serve tonight. Amen. Amen. Just a little introductory to prayer tonight. I hope you're saved and born again by God's amazing grace. And uh, if you're not, I'll just be honest with you. Lord, don't hear your prayer until you want to turn to him and not be saved and born again. But if you are saved and born again, isn't it a blessing tonight to know that we've got a God in heaven, a Father that we can come to and we can talk to and share our needs with, and uh, He can definitely meet our needs. Isn't that good? And uh, I, I was praying about something the other day, and uh, I just, I, well, i just tell you what it was. And uh, I, I was praying. That we I've been wanting a little skid steer for a pretty good while, and I got stuff at the house I need to clean up, and uh, I want we want got to knock this little building thing down over here. And I thought I said, man, we can bring it down here and take care of that. And uh, I seen one, and I, I was uh, praying about that thing, and it worked out where I could go look at it. And I wasn't gonna go back to the next evening. And a guy messaged me, and he said, I got a guy wanting to come in the morning at ten thirty and look at this thing. And this is what I told him. I texted back. I showed the message. I said, go ahead and let him come. And I said, I'll get back with you tomorrow evening. I said, whatever happens is fine. And I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, it's what I said. It's the way I pray sometimes. I said, Lord, I ain't got enough sense to know if I need that thing or not or if that's going to be the one. If it ain't, let it go. And if it is, let it be there. I'll show you the message on my phone. About 30 minutes later, he messaged back. He said, man, I forgot I'm going snowboarding in the morning. I ain't even going to be home in the morning. If you want to come look at it tomorrow evening, you come on and look at it. And so for y'all look at what I got over to the house, might not, might not look much, be much in your eyes because it's, it's rusty and everything else. But I know without a doubt the Lord let us get a hold of that with, that, with whatever else comes with it. I know the Lord worked that out because I did. I, made, I said, Lord, I ain't got enough sense to know if I need this or not. And that's the way I've got where I pray. I used to do a whole lot of wheeling and dealing, didn't I, honey, with vehicles. She counted up one time, was 170-some vehicles I've owned, something like that. 170-something? About 100. Okay, I'm sorry. So about 100-something vehicles. But I got word now. I, I tell the Lord, Lord, I don't know if I need this. If I don't need it, and I say I, I've helped pray a lot of sales for people. I say, Lord, if I don't need it, let them sell it. I don't even want to have to think about it. And sometimes I get back in touch with them. It's already gone, and at times it's there. And uh, you say, you believe that's the way the Lord works? I believe that's the way he works in my life. And because uh, I'll be honest, I ain't got enough sense to look at them. Sometimes my wants and desires get in front of what God may want for me. And so I, I want the Lord to fix things before I even have to mess with it. Amen. Amen. So with all that said, let's pray for wisdom. Lord, help us over here next door. 
and uh, we are not housing nobody over there. So if live stream's still on and uh, somebody wants to go talking about that again, nobody's been housed over there, nobody's put up over there, and ain't nothing going on over there but a little work that's uh, actually legal to do. And so uh, if you'd like to know or, or would like to see that, you just give me a call and come on down and I'll show you everything you need to know. And uh, I'm the one you need to call uh, to talk about it. Amen. Don't need to go around the other way. And so um, I appreciate what God's are doing. And uh, so y'all ask, uh, help us with uh, pray about wisdom about the next step we need to make over there with getting some of the stuff squared away tonight. Amen. Uh, amen. Little man sounds like he's about had enough back there tonight. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. 